Yekdo. Yekdo. <laughs> Yekdo means one, two for those Yekdo? people that don't understand. Yekdo. Specialists in Whole Foods and patisserie. I'm pretty sure they're spelled patisserie wrong. And then afterwards it says, <laughs> with best quality. What the fuck, bro? How is this tea so good? Chucks. 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 What happened to that boy? What happened to that boy? What happened to that boy? He was hitting dislikes. Google slap that boy. <laughs> Our dear friends, product managers at Google, they decided to remove the dislike button on YouTube. Technically, YouTube is its own business. So yeah, YouTube decided yeah. it. Well, anyway, without <laughs> getting technical on the technical. Uh, technical. <laughs> technical clarification, <laughs> sir. So as a consumer of YouTube, if I'm watching a how-to video, I need to see the like-dislike ratio. So I'm not happy about that. But as a niche Kevin Kelly 1000 true fans content creator, Chucks. I am extremely happy about this because what happened to that boy? I think there were maybe two people, one or two people who had subscribed to us, hit the bell notification, and as soon as, so they get notified, as soon as we upload a new video, they would instantly, the video would go up, within five minutes the video would have a dislike. Or two, one or two. It was me disliking your voice. <laughs> well, I don't blame you. He was talking shit, so YouTube put a clapping to that boy. If you're listening to this, we apologize that you just had to go through all of this because you're you're a civilized intellectual with high IQ probably tuning in via Google Podcast, Apple Podcast, or Spotify, or any audio streaming. If you are one of the degenerates, you're probably watching this on YouTube. And uh, today we have uh, Tava Zoshirini, Iranian patisserie on the table here with uh, Iman's. I'm extremely surprised by uh, how surprised great this uh, Iranian tea that you've brewed is. I didn't know you have these skills up your sleeve. How fortunate is, is your uh, future wife? And yeah, and we're going to the Odin launch party shortly. Our very dear friends, uh, probably if you asked me what is the startup you are, most bullish on in the UK and excited about generally and supportive of uh, that isn't our own brand. It will have to be Odin. Uh, not only an uh, exceptional team, Paddy and Mary, we're going to have them on the pod soon. But more importantly, as I said to both of them previously, you've built the startup that I would have built if I had the patience to deal with UK regulators and the bullshit that comes with creating do you want to explain what they do throw it up here on the screen and we'll link it in the description uh, they're essentially democratizing startup investing in the uk you can very cheaply set up an spv syndicate to uh, invest in startups so if you're a founder you want to take money from angels you can do that if you're a micro angel investor like us you can do that and there's a bunch of experienced angel investors on there that have their own syndicates so if you don't have your own deal flow then you can hop on one of uh, their syndicates. Syndicates start at minimum 1,000 per deal. Uh, go read my essay, also linked here, about how to invest as little as 1K in startups. Anyway, we're not here to promo, as, as I, even though I, you know, I like to sell, but anyway. It's seven minutes in and he's all he's done is promo. <clears throat> so anyway, how are things? Busy, but happy. And we're going to this party for the launch of Odin, which I'm happy for, and I'm happy for- Odin to the moon. Pat and Mary, so yeah. Inshallah, Odin, <laughs> trillion dollar company. <laughs> this is another Lindy episode because we like to record Lindy episodes because, you know, the YouTubings and the podcasting recordings works for us with the leverage and stays Lindy. So Christ, you just there's a there's a tweet you did where you like you reply who was it you replied to where you were like um they were like, Oh, what are the most tech bro words you could think of? Uh, let me is it, it Pietro? Yeah, I replied to Pietro. We'll pull it up now. He said, What are the weirdest things we people in tech say while thinking we're completely normal? <laughs> I'll start. I work in tech, deep work, mission critical, blah, 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 biz ops, a few others. And then I came back, inflection point, sticky customer base, subscribe to my Substack, rolling fund, Paul Graham essay, leverage, scalable, no code. I do keto and intermittent fasting with infrared sauna cryotherapy while sticking celery sticks up my ears. Should have been up my ass. <laughs> But in answer to your original question, the guy who wrote this uh, from Junto Investments, is it Junto or Junto? I think it's Junto. Right. Junto.investments, we'll link it all here. Uh, we had a little back and forth, great guy. Uh, you should check out his website. He is also an avid fan of Munger and Buffett philosophies to not really just investing, but to life, but a few other figures as well. He invests in the public markets. He covers a lot of decision-making, judgment principles, 
and just a lot of other awesome content you should check out. So yeah, I, I believe his name is Oliver and we'll throw Sung, it up. Oliver Sung, yeah. Oliver Sung in the description. Now he uses a lot of the you know the words you just mentioned that, that you posted on the Pietro thing. He does use quite a few of these words. However, what I would say is well the, f- the first words he says in the article is while mental models guide comprehension, principles guide behavior. But actually what he's done is he's pulled together really uh, cleanly and i really like his website he's pulled together a really clean list of 116 principles for business life and learning and what he's done is he's gone through the key big people that he likes that he appreciates that he respects and who he wants to emulate and then he's one to 116 just put short bullet points of these individuals i like the way he split it because he splits it between business investing and then life and then learning but then what you'll find is that there's a common thread across all three so yeah do you want to get into them so first section will be business slash investing principles second section will be life principles third section will be learning principles and he's taken these from it's kind of like a saying that shane parrish says sharing the best of what others have already figured out that's Mm. a good line to go ahead with i say in this case from your i suppose adam smith's and benjamin franklin's to your modern day paul graham navals and buffett and munger and many other figures but just really from people's experience and where they all overlap i guess he's shared a bunch of principles which i thought is pretty cool this is lindy it's stuff that we like to geek out over and see how we can apply it to our day-to-day as well. So It's interesting because you just released that podcast, uh, that podcast, you released that essay on angel investing recently. Actually, we did a podcast on it as well a couple episodes ago where you essentially talk about how to angel invest small checks. But as per describing that, you do quite a cool little insert of what our investing principles are and you kind of link it back to the rational investing proposition. And I think a lot of the things that we like, a lot of the things that we base our investment decisions on are actually reflected in this first section of business investing. Well, truth seekers assemble. We base our, some of our, a lot of our principles on Taleb, Maestro, Habibi, Nassim Taleb. Uh, Who liked your recent tweet. He liked my recent tweet. Uh, We should throw up his tweet. Phenomenal tweet. Phenomenal tweet by Nassim Taleb. He was dunking on Jamie Dimon of JP Morgan. We'll throw that up. It's the Barbell Strategy uh, by Nassim Taleb mixed with a few other things. Again, before we go into this episode, I have to preface by saying strong opinions loosely held because... Uh, cop out. Cop I, out. I, I look at myself two, three years ago and what I would have said in some meetings or pods or whatever. And you're like... I have this all. I have it all documented. And you're like, fucking hell. Yeah, it's... Well, if, if you don't look... What my saying is if you don't look back and cringe at some of the things you used to say, then you're not growing. But hey, anyway, without getting too philosophical, let's get into the philosophical. Business slash investing principles. Why don't you fire away? He has all in all 116 principles here. We're just going to pick a few of the ones that we like and yeah, just dive into those. So what have you got for us? I like number nine. So I'm going to start with number nine. And I think this is a nice one because it, it goes against some of the some of the beautiful wisdom that comes out of Mr. Charlie's almanac. And what is that? Diversification is protection against ignorance. Diversification is protection against ignorance. What does that mean? Diversify. Now, in the business sense, diversify your stocks, diversify your investing, diversify Mm -hmm. your industries, diversify your type of investments, diversify the way you invest, diversify the fuck out of everything because you never know what's going to crash and what's going to do well. You are ignorant is the second thing that I want to pick up on the statement is that no matter how much research you do, no matter how many people you use in that research, there is no way in hell you're ever going to beat any type of market, be it the public market, the private markets. You don't fucking know. You don't know shit. It doesn't matter who you are. You don't know shit. You can have an informed decision, but you don't know. And therefore, the best thing you can do is spread spread your bets. Do you want to explain why? Munger disagrees with this Mm -hmm. and then do you want to explain the Taleb investments barbell strategy because I think it links nicely to this so Munger is against diversification generally I forgot the saying what does he say he says diversification is for idiots no there's a rhyme to it It has a bit of wordplay but anyway he he talks about diversification yeah I I suppose in, in plain words being for idiots because there are two ways of looking at this. And I'm going to step back and not just talk about Munger. There is a challenge that Buffett set himself for a bunch of public market hedge funds, very prominent hedge funds. And I think it was, I don't exactly remember what it was, but along the lines of if any of you hedge funds can beat uh, the index, the S&P 500 index, 
I will donate this amount of money to charity or something like that. Or if you can beat me. No, I think it was. Is this Buffett you're talking about? Yes. Yeah, so I think what he did is he, he made a bet with a mate that he could choose five of the best performing hedge funds. And if they beat the S&P 500 index in any way combined yep. or individually, then he will get. And none of them did. So uh, the point is, and you say, okay, well, if if hedge funds just pick a few stocks but the S&P picks a basket of stocks, doesn't that go against because S&P is, in, is diversification? Well, yes and no. This is the only case where this doesn't apply because you are literally betting on, the way I look at it is the American economy. You're betting on the 500 largest publicly traded stocks in the US of A. And so the US of A, the Borat, US of A. I like. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> anyway, and then you have figures like Terry Smith, who they call the English Warren Buffett, runs Fundsmith. I'm invested in, I'm a huge fan of. He does some phenomenal analysis. You should watch his annual general annual meetings all on YouTube. He talks about you should never really hold more. Any your basket should always be three to twelve stocks. Obviously, it differs. You can you can hold a bit more dependent on your expertise on the market conditions, various other factors. But the point is his whole slogan is, as I wrote in my angel investing essay, which is something along the lines of buy good companies, don't overpay, do nothing. Something like that, which uh, even Morgan Household, Psychology of Money, he was like, wow, because he saw the um, the Fundsmith poster at a conference a few years ago and he took a photo of it, posted it on Twitter. He said, isn't it like, isn't that just the best thing? And diversification the problem is you're gonna handpick a bunch of stocks uh, there's people who have over 12 stocks in their basket and let's say you're heavily into tech this is just one example and tech comes crashing down because when right now things are going great tech is going to do better than any other stock any other industry any other vertical we've already discussed we'll probably publish it later but uh tech is deflationary what's happening now and also the leverage and basically to, to strip it all back diversification is you're not going to beat the market. You're going to go pick 12. You're going to absolutely overanalyze and over DD. What's that meme called the normal distribution one? There's a, there's a word for it. Is it midwits, mid dim, some bullshit like that. But anyway, there's normal distribution meme, which we'll throw up, which is uh, on both fat tails, which is the low IQ and the high IQ. They essentially end up doing the same thing. And in the middle, you have this, over DD, over analysis of diversification, I mental models. I must put into 15 stocks with low PEs, high, but, but then this, if this happens and the economy turns this way, um, I, I need diversification between tech, between pharmaceuticals, but then everyone's saying, do not go for oil and gas, but I will throw in a couple of those. Anyway, people will just go into all this analysis and in the end, you would have not defeated the market. Time is our most valuable asset. Buffett himself says over 99% of you are not really passionate about investing. Who are we kidding here? You're not going to sit there six hours a day reading annual reports. You're not going to, you're just not going to do it. And even if you do it, you still probably won't beat the market. Just put your money into the, set up a direct debit, which taxes yourself immediately as soon as your pay slip or whatever hits the account every month. That direct debit taxes you immediately before you can even spend it. That goes immediately into the S&P 500 index, and that's it. If you understand the true power of compounding and what Munger meant here about diversification, which I totally agree with, note does not apply to angel investing. Angel investing is the opposite. You need to throw dart as many as you can. So we're talking about public markets in this case, but public markets, you just go into the S&P 500 index, very simple. You can try beating it if you try, don't have a basket of, in my opinion, any more than three to six stocks. Mm. But even then, you probably won't beat it. Just put it into the S&P. Okay, so a couple of things. The first thing is that angel investing is a form of diversification. It's just it's just extreme. The second thing is on the Nassim Taleb strategy. So uh, Nassim Taleb's barbell strategy essentially says, imagine a barbell. On one side of the barbell, you have your not low risk, low fat tail risk, yeah. i.e. low risk of something turning dangerous at any given time. Uh, or fucking you over at some point in time. Put in, put on that side of the barbell investments, and we can come to life in a second, but investments that are low risk and that yield you returns over a long period of time and that probably don't go away. Things like rent on a property, right? Simple things like that. Or stock dividends, right? But here's the thing, sorry, to quickly interject. Uh, he talks about no risk assets on the very safe end, which historically would have been bonds, 
treasury bills and all of that nonsense in an inflationary environment like now. And as I said in my essay, if you're young like us, you don't have a family and uh, there's inflation, inflation is rampant, then just to be in the S&P, that 7 or 8% return is just keeping your head above water. To us, that's no risk. But this is subjective and depends on your circumstances. But yes, all in all, it, I'd say yes, I agree with what you're saying. So whatever that type of investment is, okay, let's say in this market, you probably need to hit anything above 7%, particularly in the US, to rem keep your head above water. Fine. On the flip side of, on the other side of your barbell, you're going to have ultra high risk, but potentially life-changing FU money that he calls it that can come off, come from that risk. However, what's important to note is the volume of your investment, the amount that you're actually putting into that side of the barbell is significantly lower. Now, I think in your essay, you say something like, what, 10, 15, 20, whatever it is, a very low percentage towards these high-risk assets that can give you really, really high returns if they go well. However, the flip side is, and 99% of the time this occurs, you're going to make zero money on those things. And so diversification <laughs> becomes becomes important on both sides of that barbell. However, the way that Nassim says it is don't over diversify on that smaller end of the barbell because to really take risk is to go quite strongly in a few assets that yeah. are high risk as opposed to spreading your bets like crazy. It depends on your personality profile and who you are as an individual and all that good stuff and how much disposable cash you have. But at the end of the day, I kind of agree and I like the barbell strategy. And I think it's something that you can apply not only to your finances and your investments, but also to life, which we'll come on to in a bit. He says the other 10% should be high progressive, which in my view is speculation, which is angel investing. And angel investing is, so we've discussed the public markets, which conclusion, don't try to diversify because you won't be able to beat the market really. Just put your money into the literal market, which is the S&P 500 index. Fine, that's the public markets done. Uh, what about angel investing? Angel investing is the opposite. You essentially are diversifying because of the power law, because of you, the dartboard analogy we always mention. You need to throw loads. If you look at traditional venture capital fund returns, obviously we're talking larger scale, but the return economics are pretty pretty much the same. What they do is they might make a VC fund might make a hundred investments, a hundred you know checks they throw at startups, and out of the hundred maybe to make up for all the losses on the rest of the portfolio. Naval and Nivi talk about this on, on Spearhead. They say a lot of them, if they didn't have that one big breakthrough investment, the rest of the fund would be shit. Gary Tan himself tweeted a few weeks ago, I'm surprised uh, how few uh, funds even break 3x returns. It's a very difficult market, especially now with everyone trying to become a VC, no one trying to start startups. Uh, well, compared to how many are starting funds or going into VC. So it's tough. But yes, uh, if you're going to do angel investing, I, th I think barbell strategy is probably the best way to go because that 10% uh, that you're gambling with, the other 90% you're absolutely fine. So you can gamble that. What's another one that you like? Number 15, never interrupt compound interest unnecessarily. And we, even we who talk about this so much and have dived into the numbers and the Excel sheets and tr we're like, yeah, we understand compound interest. Listen, no one really understands the true power of compound interest. We know that 99% of Buffett's wealth came after the age of 65 and he started investing when he was 10. As I said in my financial minimalism article, here is the analysis of me stunting and going crazy with money when I was 18. Uh, compared to if I'd stacked some of that money uh, into my 20s and the difference that makes on the compound interest is something like the difference of in a decade, it's an extra million or something like that. And that is a very conservative assumption because you're not considering increased deposits every month with many variables such as increasing salary, a lot of other variables that I excluded. So a conservative assumption, a decade earlier as a young person, you'd make a million extra. Um, you can go read the essay if you want to see the analysis more and better. But Einstein said himself, he said that compound interest, eighth wonder of the world or whatever. Yeah, I can't, dis I think it's every day I try, I have like a reminder, I try to remind myself, never interrupt it. And again, we're talking about the business principles that Oliver's covered here, but equally applies to life. We have on our website, Take a Shot Naval, which is uh, compound interest. He says something that we've quoted. I forgot what it is on the site, but he says, <laughs> he, it's, it's about interest, but especially in relationships. In business, in startups, especially we're talking about business here, business principles. 
one of the key things which I can't remember if Michael Seibel was saying this or Paul Graham, but they said one of the, or someone else, one of the key reasons for startups failing is co-founder conflicts. And when they dived into the numbers and they analyzed how long have these people known each other and all of that, they realized that relationships that were just a few years were a lot more likely to break down and have co-founder conflicts. Yeah. Like, me and you, we've no, I, unfortunately, I've known you since uh, 1998 uh, in the Iranian school playground. And in these last 23 years, as I said, uh, we used to say, been with my team 20 years like Wenger, as our friend, who's Arya says. Uh, but now I can't even say that because it's been 23 years. <laughs> with us, if if there is, uh, hopefully, touch wood, I don't, ha- I don't end up, uh, you know, throwing you out the window one day from uh, frustration. But the way it goes is it's more of like a, it compounds. It's it's like reputation. It's like trust. It's like anything else. So in business, it's extremely important. The longer you've known your co-founders, I think, is crucial because you have more of a family-like or a brotherly-like relationship, which is, yes, brothers also argue, but then they slap each other around the neck and say, uh, hey, fucker, we need to do this next. Let's get moving or something like that. So I think, I think it's a combination. So the compound interest element from a financial perspective, like that just makes sense. And I don't think people realize until they're 65, but because people are short-term focused, they don't really give it enough time and they don't understand the value. Especially in today's society. Yeah, exactly. Especially in today's society. Let's, but let's put all of our money in crypto. There is one thing that's really, there's, <laughs> there's one thing that's really interesting on that front, which is one of the things he says is number 14, don't fall in love with an investment, be situation dependent and opportunity driven. Don't fall in love with an investment, be situation dependent and opportunity driven. Why is this interesting? Well, actually, I would disagree with him. And I'll tell you why. Don't fall in love with an investment. I agree with that on the face value of it, right? Which is because you're diversifying or to the extent that you are diversifying, you can't really be in love with an investment because you move away from a rational decision, decision-making decision framework and you'll go into your irrational human element of, of your psyche, which is just like, I love this and I want to stick to it. Be situation dependent and opportunity driven is not necessarily mutually exclusive from that. Mm-hmm. The reason is, often the opportunities require you to fall in love with that element. And the great example is Web3 and historically, you know, the crypto space and Bitcoin. And another thing about that that's really interesting is because the space is so well loved and because so many people are so gassed about Bitcoin and or Ethereum and or Web3 and or NFTs, whatever it is, they are the early sort of adopters. And because these guys are on Twitter, speaking promoting talking about this at a level of of love echo chamber it is an echo chamber but what it fundamentally does is it increases the value of that asset yep artificially or not it doesn't matter because fundamentally what they're doing is their perception of it exactly if you want to strip it back to i'd say first principles they always say uh, well here it says don't fall in love with an investment i'd say that applies to many areas of life where you attach emotion to the outcome i think it was robert uh, cialdini who said in influence uh, the psychology of persuasion he mentioned something along the lines of or maybe it may have been somewhere else but the concept of think about yourself every time you've really attached yourself to an outcome like let's say someone says ah this job interview is everything i'm gonna prepare i'm gonna really sell myself i'm gonna go in there i'm gonna wow them same thing with people who try to do this stuff on first dates i'm gonna go and really wow them i'm gonna do all of this or in any area of your life it just it you end up it ends up going nowhere whereas the person who cares less the person who just really does not give a shit is the one who has the power and influence or control or and it's not really about just power and influence it's more so the, the stoicism but you know that there are trillions of moving variables outside of your control so if you attach yourself to any outcome you could do all the analysis you could have all like the full on r- thick rational lens and nothing else and you could still not get the outcome that you were hoping for because a lot of time it's due to we don't talk about there's a chapter in the psychology of money by Morgan Housel where he talks about luck versus risk and I think that's very very applicable to this so I'd say don't attach yourself to any outcome Kapil at Kapil Gupta MD Sida Performance who is Naval's personal advisor very deep guy sometimes I have to listen to his things a few times to even very deep and also very confrontational very confrontational but I understand why he has no patience for people's bullshit Sida, Sida says you could force people to do something but end of the day people will just do what they're bound to do anyway so I can sit here and say 
don't be emotional about an outcome. But even me with all of this, this oh, the, the meditative third eye of observing oneself, as I always say, even I, as, as I try to use the critical thinking, get caught out sometimes by getting emotional about certain things or decisions. So it's very tough. But at least with some critical thinking and self-awareness and trying to improve in that area, you can reduce the number of things that you attach an emotional outcome to, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does make sense. And I think it, it fits nicely into going into life principles. So, I mean, we, there's, there's, there's what, 43 different principles in the business section. It ironically actually finishes with venture capital is a game of home runs, not averages. <laughs> we, we've done an episode on venture capital and venture capital is a game. Episode two, I think. It was, but then we've also done like multiple other episodes. Basically, on we've space. mentioned that every episode. So yeah, cool. it, it's, it's not, a, it, yeah, it's a game of, it's the Babe Ruth effect. If you, if you Google Babe Ruth effect venture capital, there's a number of uh, really good articles on it. Babe Ruth is a baseball player historically, if you're from England. Life principles. What's your favorite one on this list? There are how many are there? There are fucking hell. There's loads. There's fifty of them. Oh, I, I love the first one. Principles outlive tactics. Principles. Principles. And I and I I I really like this. Not only from can, can I just uh, can I just stop you there? Huh? That the fact that you love that, I could literally see. This is the type of thing that someone would get fucking tattooed on their back after they've listened to, <laughs> after they've listened to 85 hours of Naval and Tim Ferriss and fucking, I don't know, who else? Balaji. Think boy. Think, <laughs> literally think boy. B-O-I. Boy. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Anyway, well, it's interesting because I'm anti-tattoos, but maybe, maybe we can put it up here next to Cyrus the Great on the wall. But anyway, principle, <laughs> principles outlive tactics. The principles. And <laughs> that's how Cyrus is. And principles. And Chucks. it's not only from personal experience, but more so even reading or learning from other people's mistakes. ABL, always be learning. ABL is one of our sayings, and it's not asset-based lending. It's actually <laughs> always be learning. I don't know what other fucking kind of lending there is. It has to be asset-based. <laughs> Sorry, continue. <sighs> fucking too many interruptions. Leverage like banking. Thoughts. <laughs> Sorry, we'll, we'll try DCF. to be professional. Uh, D DCF. <laughs> Uh, DCF analysis. There's this video of Cyrus <laughs> back when he was in banking and he called himself the wedge banker. <laughs> and he's got like these bands. We'll and throw, like, it up, <laughs> throw it up, <laughs> throw it uh, up. It's, it's a Snapchat, which is, this was from summer 2015. Fucking hell, was it six years ago? Yeah, and I, I, I was, because I, I was doing a late night shift in banking and I was using this bicep <laughs> machine I had next to my desk. And uh, the tagline was, it's a tough life trying to be a wedge banker. And uh, it's me in my, it was either my Lokes or Church's uh, calf leather Oxfords it with uh, a, uh, it was with a two and a half kilogram bag of my protein. Uh, who are, that, that's not a, like an overstatement. It was, it was, it was the a big two and a half kilogram. Yeah. They were actually a client afterwards. But anyway, and me trying to do a bicep curl while trying to do financial modeling. Off topic here. So back to, no, 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 no. It's fully on topic. Why? Because you said principles outlive tactics. Your principles lived with you while you were in banking. This is a really interesting point because you go ahead. Uh, you, the mic is yours. You never, you never lost. Maybe you, maybe you did it in the office, but from what I saw externally, you never lost who you truly were or who you believed you were. And I think part of the reason you lasted so, you didn't last that long. I mean, you look, how long are you? Three and a half years in banking. Four years. Uh, if, if you include the German bank before it, uh, yeah. four to five years. Let, let's say five years. Four right? and a half, five years. So if you say five years, in, that's not a, that's, that is actually a relatively long time for a lot of juniors. But if you think about it in a career perspective, five years isn't that long in an industry. And the reason why I think you left is because you were true to your principles and who you were internally from a life perspective, not necessarily business. And so the tactics you learned, fantastic. You learned financial modeling, you learned how to understand a business, how to diligence, how to do all of that stuff. However, you stay stuck true to your principles and left pretty quickly to do your own thing, leveraging the tactics that you learned while you were there. Correct, but 100% agree. But I'd go even deeper, which is uh, in today's Think society boy. where... <laughs> where short-termism is rampant, it's everyone chasing tactics and they're not sticking to principles. I even find myself doing this at times. I have a, we have a bunch of principles that we say we like to stick to. Yeah, and sometimes the FOMO, the groupthink or herd mentality kicks in. This especially happens when you spend too much time on Twitter and people are all lumping their money into one thing and everyone's talking about it and you're like, but that person's very smart and so is that person. And generally, if you're chasing always the shortcuts if you're chasing the tricks the best way to describe this is as aaron clary asshole consulting says he says check out the website it's fucking hilarious it's phenomenal I, I love aaron's channel he's i think he's viewed 
one of our couple of our videos before maybe because I, I messaged him. But anyway, his books are phenomenal, by the way. If It's very based, so if you are a leftist, you should probably not read. Uh, if you have a social sciences degree, and anyway, we're not going to go there. We, we do this every episode. We. We. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Aaron Clary says, there's a hard way to do things and a really hard way to do things. The hard way is, for example, okay, fuck, I've got to do this four years uh, aerospace engineering or electrical engineering degree then i've got to go do these internships then i've got to message will brewy at vada space and go and do an internship there then i got to go to another space come do an internship while doing a research paper on a, on a thing there and building up my experience and reading and learning and That's, kissing ass and working for people and having to answer questions and all of that stuff just not vada is a great company will brewy it is, is a great, great company will brewy is probably one of my favorite guests we've ever had on what a great guy but that was just an example of someone who's trying to break into a really tough industry even let's talk about software engineering. Ah, fuck, okay. I've got to stick, read these thick books and do all these online courses and do all of this shit. <laughs> thick, T-H-I-double-C. <laughs> Double C, triple C. Thick, thick books. <laughs> thick. <laughs> I've got to read these thick books. I've got to do all this hard work. Aaron Clary reference. Oh, but math is hard. I quoted something. Let's, if I've still got it, we'll throw it up where I quote tweeted a Paul Graham post around education in the UK, I think it was, mm. and STEM degrees or something like that. And then Aaron Clary, uh, I tagged him and he said, oh, but math is hard <laughs> with, with his US <laughs> Midwest accent. Because that's, that's just in, it applies to any area of your life. There's a hard way of doing things, which is you could go the long route. Mm -hmm. Or there's a really hard way, which is you jump from trend to trend, opportunity to opportunity. You're on this Twitter echo chamber. Last year, it was creator economy. This year, it's Web3. Now you're doing all of this Discord shit, trying to invest in the DAL that buys the US constitution. And then you're doing all of, the, all of this other fuck shit. <laughs> that's, that's chasing. Yes, you will most likely. There's many people who have made seven figures from this whole crypto craze. Mm -hmm. But... These are short-term tactics, uh, I think. We're not, and we're not just picking on crypto. Crypto has its benefits too. But what, what we're talking about here is in any area of your life, if you're chasing shortcuts, if you're hopping trend to trend, if, you, if you're not sticking to a book of principles and values that you have from the outset, it's not going to work long term. You're, you're going to have a life of misery because that's the really hard way. It is. The hard way is doing the work. The really hard way is all these tactics, all the shortcuts. That's, that's basically a summary. Principles outlive tactics. I like that. Another one, which is quite nice and is one that I think is reflective of the rational way of doing things, our way of doing things, is a combination of two of them. The first one is number nine, which is embrace reality and deal with it. A real rationalism to the way you approach things. So embrace reality and deal with it, which I think is important. And then number 22, take a shot Naval. He's, I think, quoted this from Naval, which we've picked up before. Which This is, was the one I was mentioning earlier, the compound play, relationships. Play long-term games with long-term people. The deal with it is really interesting because a lot of ways in which we react to things are emotional by nature. And by nature, I mean because we're human beings and we can't really think through a rational way of thinking when our emotions and our brain fire in a spiked way. I think what's quite nice about what he says is he also always says the way to minimize risk is to think, right? And I think that's linked, particularly in life generally, but for a long-term perspective in life, it doesn't mean you can't get angry. But what I really like and what links back to the rational VC sort of framework and principles that we've created is an ability to think long-term, an ability to understand shit long-term, an ability to forget the short-term hiccups that occur on that route to get you to your long-term goals is something that Ray Dalio says, and, and I think might be quoted in this article, but is, is around having the audacity to have certain goals that are long-term enough, mm -hmm. but moving on from failure in the short term to reach your aud audacious goals. That is something that I actually, I don't think you actually see in places like corporate environments. And actually you see it more in places like the US where there is this, opt ra well, not necessarily rational, but some optimism there that you don't see here. And that combination of not giving a shit about the short term fluctuations, but finding your long term goal and going after and making sure those goals are audacious, by the way, is a beautiful thing that culturally has to be relevant and has to exist for you to take it on. But also you personally have to be able to deal with the emotion that's, that exists there. Yeah, I think it's the 
second value we have on the yeah. rational stuff, which is we may even publish it online at some point. We, we don't really employ people. It's a, it's a fun project for us uh, in our spare time. But if we did have a values deck like the great Packy McCord who created the original Netflix deck, uh, I'd make a hell of a deck out of it. But it would be a very base deck, you could say, a culture deck. But the, the first principle we have is authenticity. The second one authenticity. is authenticity, <laughs> as we had discussed last episode, a whole episode on it. The second one is long-term thinking. Yes. Um, there are a few others I won't go over now. We're going to stick to what we're discussing. But one of them, which I have to mention before we move on, is as the great Curtis Jackson says, I have to quote him every episode. For those that don't know, that's 50 cent. <laughs> he says... But, by the way, can I just stop you there? The reason you always say Curtis Jackson, is there a reason? Or do you just not like saying 50 Absolutely. cent? Absolutely. <laughs> oh, I'm, we don't have time, but I'm glad you brought... We're going to get going to this party. I'm glad you brought up this question. I'll try to be brief. Um, you try to be brief. <laughs> <laughs> so... I highly recommend, I know I know a lot of you will be like, what? That's very, it's, it's out there, it's weird. I highly recommend, I've always been a huge 50 Cent fan. I, I grew up listening to him. Read his book, or especially listen to the Audible, the audio version of his book, Hustle Harder, Hustle Smarter, something like that. <laughs> Even the title, I knew you'd piss yourself. <laughs> is, need, is that is does, does that come from, <laughs> with like a Gary Vee signature at the front of it? No. Look, oh, you're... you're, you're <laughs> We actually went to 50 Cent Concert know, three years ago. You're pissing yourself. And I know when I saw the title, I was like, oh, come on, give me a fucking break. Like, I like 50 Cent, but give me a break with the title. But listen to the audio book because he narrates it as well. It's just phenomenal. Like, there's a reason Robert Greene, one of the greatest authors of our time, probably I think in history, in my view, with his phenomenal books, did a book with 50 Cent called The 50th Law. Like, The 40th Laws of Power is a, is a classic of a classic. And he went and did a fifth, The 50th Law, like a second version with 50 Cent because of his insights on just his extremely rough upbringing and how he's navigated through life. It's really a book on psychology, life principles. He covers everything. He even goes into, if you're joining a startup, get a damn lawyer to check your contract about your the terms of your options and sh shit like that. He's like a lot of Silicon Valley people or, or tech or founders or whatever will try to fuck you over. He goes into everything. He even goes into like, uh, just slating Tony Yeo and Lloyd Banks and how no disappointed way. he is with them because he he talks they they're still his guys but he uh, talks yeah, down thought, on them because he's like the leader of the clan. I didn't know he still talked down. I thought they'd like quash the beef and he wouldn't say anything. Like nah. That. Anyway, we're going way off topic, but <laughs> you have to listen to that book. I've, I've, okay, I've yeah, asked but why'd you call him the Curtis Jackson? Jackson? <laughs> and the reason I call him Curtis Jackson in that book, uh, <laughs> near near the beginning, he says I got rich off the persona Fifty Cent. He said in my songs I would talk about things like smoking weed drinking he says i've never smoked weed in my life i don't drink even though he has an out, a cognac brand or something yeah he's he's a goat of just everything and he says uh people buy 50 cents in the boardroom i'm curtis jackson oh. and this book and and in the book he he, flip, he sort of flips between the two uh there's the real him and there's the act or persona that he put on to become wealthy and successful basically 50 cent was an act to get his foot in the door and accumulate wealth. And then when he accumulated wealth and he switched to the TV industry, which is doing exceptionally well in right now, he switched to his sort of, you could say, authentic self, Curtis Jackson. Or whatever. Mm. So you have to call him Curtis Jackson. He's, he's not that, that that's... Right. Calling him 50 Cent is like calling me, which we won't include now, but it's like calling me by my corporate name when I was in corporate. <laughs> it's like your tag name. It's not you. You're putting on an act to accumulate uh, a bit of clout, social status, uh, climbing a ladder, doing some bullshit, maybe a bit of wealth, a bit of money. It's all bullshit. Anyway, HKH, next point. A couple of other things that I think are linked to what we've already spoken about. One of them is number 30, avoid dealing with people of questionable character. Um, number 29, know that people are wired very differently. Oh, that's a great one. Sorry, very quickly. Know that people are wired differently is um, in investing, especially before I used to question why is this idiot, make, like this random person, for instance, why is this idiot making this stupid decision on, on this invest? Why is he investing in this? Or another person, wow, he, that's, a, that's a great... Wow. Wow. Much wow. <laughs> much, much wow. <laughs> that's a great deal he got there. <laughs> no, people's... Uh, this is all based on people's perceptions and they develop yeah. these perceptions based on just the time and place they were born and where they were raised. Uh, so someone who was going through a... Uh, inflationary decade or period would have very different 
risk appetite and investment criteria compared to someone who went through a low inflation environment like, like the uh, or a bull market like we saw in the past decade. Who was it that said that? There was someone that spoke about this. I can't remember. It was a famous it investor. It may have been maybe. Morgan Housel. It might have been. I, it, it may have been Morgan Housel. It might have been Buffett in one of his AGMs maybe. where he was speaking about how different investing propositions in different Probably. investment managers from different um, periods have different but but criteria. very important so you got to have a bit of i suppose empathy if you can call it in understanding that they are all wired very differently due Maybe. to various going back to what i said earlier like trillions of variables out of their control uh, and they're not aware of it morgan household has a great saying before we move on from this point where he says how you invest uh, you think that 80 percent of the investing world works like that Whereas your perception is just zero point zero 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 one percent of the actual how of how the markets work. I love that. So, That's such a good point. So that that goes back to this, I suppose, and we can move on to the next one. Okay, the next bit is learning principles, right? Now, there's a lot of these that I like. A lot of them are a bit woo woo, as you like to say as well. But I think they're important. Sorry, think sorry, we sorry, about sorry. Them. Before before you, uh, oh, you got uh, gas, didn't you, on a previous one? <laughs> <laughs> we'll do one of those director cut scenes. <laughs> number uh number <laughs> number 48 on the life principle yeah i like this one it's a good one is not wanting something is as good as having it for the 50 millionth time plug my lindy essay on financial minimalism in life i talked about i probably touched on this but to elaborate further and also point 40 so 47 and 48 47 is stuff that doesn't produce happiness time control does mm -hmm. Woohoo! number 48 not wanting something is as good as having it. Common sense. 47 goes back to the Nassim Taleb tweet where he shits on Jamie Dimon um, and my essay on financial minimum. Wait, wait, wait. Let's give some background. So Jamie Dimon is who the CEO of JP, JP Morgan. Morgan. He made a joke about China not existing as long as JP Morgan will exist. Essentially a snipe at the CCP, at the Communist Party of China. Now, what he then did afterwards is a day later after that got released, he basically came out and apologized and Taleb came out and was like, you're basically a pussy. Like, why are you apologizing? I've got F you. I've got less money than you. I've still got more F you money than you. Because it goes I back to, to, I don't remember exactly, but a criticism of something they published in a Chinese version, I think, of one of Taleb's books where they had to take something out yes. for cultural reasons. And then he snapped back and uh, didn't like it publicly. The Taleb's point is, I can snap back, but you have to go and apologize to the Chinese. And he says, nice to wake up to find out that I am freer, less dependent, and though not as though not as rich, have much, much more solid fuck you money than Jamie Dimon. Slavery does not decrease with wealth. Like and uh, of course, I said literally the greatest of all time. Uh, shukran Maestro Taleb for all that you've given us may your deadlifts increase for another hundred years that's I think in all of my time on Twitter that's one of the best my favorite tweets of all time because uh, it touches on what I've literally written in a whole essay before not wanting something is as good as having it, it goes back to you detach your, detach yourself from outcomes yes and it's common sense like <laughs> kind of a lot of people won't get that because they think that you need to hustle harder like Mr. Curtis Jackson says, but I, I guess, and, 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 you know, a lot of people say settle day just gold and all that good stuff, but actually law of attraction, go and Google that. And f that is a whole load of yeah, that, bullshit. But that, that's kind of what he's, <laughs> that's what he's getting at. Right. I.e. not wanting something is as good as having it. There's two ways you can interpret that. Right. And one of the ways is that is essentially don't overkill. But it has to be really not wanting it. Correct. It's not a, I'm going to pretend I don't want it, even though deep down you want it. Exactly. Going back to Kapil Gupta, MD, he says humans essentially, something along the lines of humans will gravitate towards what deep down they want, even yes. if logically they try not to. So uh, that's an important point. Your purpose in life is predetermined. That's nothing on this list. It's just to that point. All right, learning principles go. Which one do you like? Well, I started this podcast with number two, hold opinions loosely. Yep. I've already said that. Why? Why? That's an actually interesting one. A lot of people will be like, fuck you. You need to know what you like and you need to stick to your points. And Literally, as I opened with strong opinions loosely held, because if you don't look back and cringe on something you may have said or believed in a few years ago, then uh, it's a sign of not growing. Not always, but usually exception to every rule. I think it shows a flexibility to the individual that shows that they are rational enough to take new information on and change their mind. And David humility Sachs to... Uh, yeah, the humility. humility. 
I think that's a beautiful trait. I think it's it's one of the best learning principles you can have. Best person uh, who said this was uh, Chamath Stanford talk a few years ago. Yeah. And uh, why are you gassing this with, guy? With his, his public speaking is great. Uh, and he said, you know, it's totally fine to always change your mind. You guys should try it. Or something is this like a, that. Was this a Stanford, the Stanford one, talk? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, but he was doing that on purpose because he fucking, yeah. yeah. He's just going to these know-it-alls and trying to get up their bum. All right, what's another one? I like this. I like number 16. Number 16 is a different one, but I like it. It says, it's better to remember the obvious than to grasp the esoteric. It's better to remember the obvious than to grasp the esoteric. Why is this important? Is because I think it goes back to a couple of other, other things we've talked about. For example, investing around your circle of competence, diversifying if you don't, etc., and what it's essentially saying is, do the basics well. Do not try to outsmart at the margins. Take a Pareto approach to all things yep. that you do in life and learning and just get the fucking main things down. Once you get the main things down, the foundation is built. Then you can build on top of that stack. If you think of it like a tech stack, you can, you know, you've got the Ethereum protocol and then you can build on top of that protocol with cool other yep. propositions. The same thing applies to learning. However, what I would say, is that there is a broad suite of foundational things you can learn. And if it's referencing investing, there's a broad, there is a broad range of stuff you could even learn within investing. But understand the key features of whatever domain you're in and then have loose held opinions around the, the edges of those foundations. Applies to every area of life. Let's say working out. You can go, oh, and, do all, good example. You can go and do all this fuck shit with uh, wrist arm curl, uh, forearm curls. It applies to working out because you can do all of this bullshit you can do all of these machines. By the way, if, if you are new in, into weights, uh, rule number one, as I know strong ideologies, but this, this belief is true. As Mark Gripito says, he says, these commercial gyms, the reason they have these machines, this was popularized back in the 80s or 90s, just as, as a commercial business to bring people in and they get the feeling that they're being healthy or you're breaking a sweat, sure. But it's all bullshit. Just stick to the, as you said, the... What was it? The, the, the foundational. The foundational, yeah. the simple yet critical, which is in a gym, for instance, squats, deadlifts, bench press, overhead press. You can start there. Pull-ups. Pull-ups. That's it. That's genuine. That's it. basically it. That's basically it. Maybe you can throw in barbell row or dumbbell row. That's basically it. Those four or five exercises. It applies to every area of life. So, yeah. What's another one you like? Number 13. Reading is faster than listening. Doing is faster than watching. And I know earlier I mentioned a Curtis Jackson audiobook. That's an exception. I do listen to audiobooks. That, that's not an exce- That's different. That's a completely yeah. different thing because because Fifty Cent is actually narrating it, which yes, is the good exactly, part. Exactly, which it. is why I listen to it. Yeah. Of course, I still have Audible just for if you're trying to optimize. Uh, well, actually, I I think one thing we need to get into more is uh, as human beings in modern day is as Cal Newport says. Uh, enjoy being bored yeah. and enjoy reflecting. So I, I I try not to listen to as many audiobooks if I am on, let's say, on a walk or something. Uh, nonetheless, there are some times where if I'm doing errands or just some nonsense where you're multitasking, you're not going to reflect on life or anything anyway and you can't be bored. So I listen to an audiobook. Even then, I don't really retain much and read anything I read is definitely I retain way more. Uh, even if I've read something once, a lot of the things I've referenced in this pod, for instance, are things that I've read or I've picked up in books over time. While in the moment, reading may seem much slower and to some people boring who are trying to read. Boring, slow, oh, this. Uh, you don't read enough if you listening, find it boring. Yeah, listening is so much easier. But actually, even if you pull through the slog and read, I'd still find that faster than listening because you actually retain it. So it's how you measure it and doing. And the next part, he says, doing is faster than watching. This is what I was trying to say earlier before uh, got completely off track, quoting uh, Curtis Jackson, one of our values, which is kind of got from him, which is just be doing shit. Yeah. Just be doing shit. Yeah. You can sit there and another gym principle, just sort of example, sorry. You can read all of these books about from Ripper on how to squat, how to deadlift. Read it in a few hours, go and do it. Go and do it every day, every week, every week. I, we've been training for how long? Like a decade, in and out, in and out. But we've been training for a decade, yet still we're always tweaking. We're like, ah, the squat, the hips should have moved 
a little bit more this, a little bit more that way. Or, oh, recently I started low bar squatting because my, you're always tweaking and adapting. You learn by doing, not by reading. And there's almost everything that you will learn. Read books, but beyond that, go and just do shit. Just be doing shit. So it's one of our values. There's another one which I think is part of our values, which is number six. Always keep asking why, why, why. It's interesting that he's put three whys. There's the five whys principle. There's a video that I think Gary Tan does on this, which is quite good. It's first principles-based approach to thinking. It's the thing that Elon Musk popularized with the creation of SpaceX. And we also did a a video on that ourselves on first principles thinking. But anyway, the point I'm trying to raise is the way in which you do is to go and just do. Yes, but the things you need to think about before you go and do often requires you to get to the core of the problem. And how do you get to a core of a problem is whatever you are testing, you should always be asking, in my opinion, five whys just keep going down that rabbit hole an interesting thing that we say to a lot of people or at least i do when i talk to youngsters that are looking to break into whatever it is that they're looking to do what deranged youngsters trying to get into traditional finance not necessarily that but but that also learn to code chucks and part of learning to code is being able to think from first principles because you're building from scratch and what's really important is being naturally curious And if you're not naturally curious, you are capable of becoming more curious. The more you read, the more you do, the more you think, the more likely you are to be curious. And that's what's really interesting about this this point. And I think when you become more curious, you ask more questions. And all of us, regardless of how intelligent you think you are or are, uh, I don't care if you're the number one person on Mensa or whatever it is, you will always have questions about certain things. Life is ultra complex, so you're going to always have to ask why. So don't be ashamed and don't be worried and be somewhat very, actually, I I should say, curious about things and just fucking go after it. And if you can do, if you can combine those things, I think it puts you in very good stead for whatever discipline you end up in life. Yes. And I think the last one we should wrap up with is number 20. Never fool yourself and remember that you are the easiest person to fool. Ah, yes. (laughs) I like that one. I said this earlier. I said... I even catch myself sometimes going, you know, drifting away from some principles or values that I'd have down on paper um, historically. So, yeah, we are, as you mentioned, Ray Dalio earlier, he his book dives into the psychology of humans and you study history for the last 800 years. You just see it's a cyclical pattern of human behavior repeating itself. That's what you learn from history, um, because deep down humans don't change. It's biology i guess i like dalio because he's quite he simplifies a lot of things so a lot of what he talks about in his principles book is fundamentally about these loops and about these reoccurrences of human nature yeah and maybe it was him who said that stuff about people experience different things based on when they're born but they maybe. fundamentally experience the same thing within post-generation so as long as something exits your period of memory you're probably you're most likely as humans to to go through that thing again. So he has this sort of loop, and the loop goes: audacious goals, failure, applying learning principles from those failures, improving as a result of those principles and the failure, and therefore setting more audacious goals. So fundamentally, you're reaching your goals through this cycle of failure, learning, and improving mm-hmm. consistently. But while you're doing that, you're also setting new goals because you're going higher and higher and higher. Yep. And human nature enables you to do that because we always want the next best thing. And I think that's a beautiful way to end this, i.e. apply these learning principles to your failures and you will improve. Chucks. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Okay, well, this was a uh, one of those episodes we squeezed in. Hopefully you've enjoyed it. We have a, as you, as you guys probably know, if, if you don't know now, as they say, you get to know. You get as to they know, say. <laughs> as they say. You will find out that we're very selective with the guests that we bring on the pod. We do more musings episodes, which is us doing this. And once every few episodes, we may bring on an elite guest or in our eyes as, as an elite person. Elite doesn't mean loads of wealth or loads of whatever social status or whatever in, in the eye of the masses, I'd say, but in... Our, our view is someone who we highly respect. And so we're very selective, but we have some people that we uh, really think are great and admire coming on. And in in the, in the, we've got a few lined up. One of them is actually going to be the Odin episode, which we're going to do in, in person. Um, but the others stay tuned and go check out my latest essay and Iman's latest essay on rationalvc.com. Honestly, at this point, I'm not going to pitch it because I don't need, it's too good. It's too good to pitch. Just if you don't want to check it out, 
don't check it out. You're lost. And throw us more dislikes because YouTube's hidden the dislike <laughs> button now. And uh, yeah, but, but like us on uh, on all the other platforms. That's that's about it. Anything else? No, let's go party. Let's. Uh, uh, wow, you look so excited. <laughs> <laughs> Peace, trucks.